right, um, if I can have your attention, I'd like to first off welcome everybody. Uh, this is uh, basically an open house and a workshop to give you a lot of information on where we're headed with the uh, with wind stream and uh, broadband connectivity here in Lowndes County. This is something that we've been working for a long, long time on in Lowndes County um, to try to figure out how we can make improvements. What we realized very early on is that it was a much bigger project than what just something the county could actually take on by ourselves. So we realized real quick that it was going to take something that was going to have, let's just say, deeper pockets to be able to get this, get, uh, get broadband where we need to be in this county. Broadband has become and is a real quality of life issue here in any community in rural, uh, in rural Georgia, really in the United States. So it's extremely important that we start focusing on this, that we understand that, and fortunately, um, our state leaders, our federal leaders, they finally realized it, and I think a lot of it came certainly from the impact that COVID has had on this country for the last two, two and a half years, realizing that if, if we as citizens are not able to gather or assembly in, in an environment to allow us to learn and meet, then we have to do it remotely. Well, the only way you can do it remotely is with broadband and you know that proper connectivity. So there was the issue. Where is the solution? How can we address this? So fortunately, um, there was some funding that was made available. Uh, it was basically a, a, a bid type process. Lowndes County was approached by Windstream to see if we had an interest in, we thought about it about a half a second and said, certainly, we're, we're, we want to partner with you on this. And so we have done that. And so we look forward to a great relationship there uh, with, with Windstream. As we branch out into Lowndes County, to basically serve a targeted group of folks that's around 18,000 citizens or households, 18,000 that are either unserved or underserved here in Lyons County. And this is extremely important because we do have a lot of rural areas and for our community to continue to grow, uh, the quality of life issue with broadband internet connectivity is extremely important and it is a must have. That's where we're at this day and time. So I uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I think at this time what I'd like to do, if you will, let's all rise and pledge and um, and then we'll move on into the meeting. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, I'd like to recognize at this point we have a very important factor for our community that fought hard for this. Uh, Senator Russ Goodman is with us. Russ, thank you for coming. Uh, because again, without your type of your folks and champion this issue, it would not have happened. So again, we thank you very much for your efforts. At this time, I'd like to call on Mr. Michael Forbes, if I could. Uh, Michael, if you'd come through, come up, introduce the folks that you have here, and then give us uh, an update on where we're at. Appreciate it. Thank yes, you. Sir. Thank you. Well, my name is Michael Ford, President of Operations for Georgia. I live up in Cleveland, Georgia. So it's a pleasure to be down here today. And I do have with me my team today. We've got David. David is the local manager for this area. So um, as this network gets built out, he'll be the one that's in charge of the technicians that call on everyone uh, will be the local presence. In all the communities we serve, we have a local presence. We, we really, if you look at the history of our company, we're an aggregation of small telephone companies in the rural parts of Georgia and the other 17 states that we serve. So in each one of those areas, we've got a footprint of that remnant of that telephone company. Um, it equates to, we've got about 680 employees in Georgia that are just in our part of the operations, the kinetic field operations portion. Also with me, we've got Dina Perry. Dina is the government affairs, VP of government affairs for the state. I come back, I've got Daryl Barron. Darren is the director, Daryl is the director for South Georgia. So we've got three directors, Daryl handles South Georgia. And uh, 
terrific team. You know, I think as you get, if you don't know our team, as you get to know our team, what I love about them is just a great group of humble servants uh, across the state, and just blessed to have the group that we that we have to work with. Daryl's helping me by grabbing the. We're going to have this in the room next door as well. Um, after this, we're going to be able to, uh, you can go next door to where our retail agents will be, and they will be able to type in your address and tell whether you're in the area that's going to be upgraded to fiber or not. As the chairman mentioned, we've got about 18,000 locations uh, that, that are part of this project. So, Connecticut Windstream. Connecticut by Windstream has invested about 18 million, and then the state has 22 million. So between our investment and the state's investment, we've got a total of about 40 million dollars that's going to go into this project. And we are just grateful. It may not be straight, but it'll give you an idea of what we're. It's like we got a week later. That's okay. That's okay. Like I said, this will be available next door too. So we'll uh, we'll go over it with you. Um, but also, as the chairman said, this took a lot of effort. It took a lot of group effort between your county, between our team, and between the state legislators to make it happen. There was it wasn't going to happen with one person, with one group. It took everybody working closely together, and. Uh, it took the supports. There were a lot of applications for these projects. So I think what really helped make the difference is when you could go in with an aggregation show and everybody was working together. And you had a, a voice that was, was all tied together, working in one, one unison path towards making it happen. So um, I do just, so 900 miles of fiber, approximately. Again, 18,000 homes and businesses. And just a special thank you to the Board of Commissioners for giving us the opportunity to work with you. We are excited about this. We love rural Georgia. Um, I, I just can't tell you how passionate our team is. We serve 18 states, and they call me, and they say, what is it about Georgia? And well, you all know there's something special about Georgia, as it is. But the heart of our, the heart of our employees and the passion that they have towards serving the communities. If we had, so far this year, I put around 200 people through training. And every time we go in and we talk to those new technicians going through training, you tell them, your hands are gonna be all over the infrastructure that drives the economies of rural Georgia. Because, as we were talking about before this, that you're getting to the point where the haves and have nots. Where you have fiber, you're gonna be able to drive your economy <coughs> forward. Where you don't, going to have to keep working to get it there. And that's the other part. You know, the job's not done. There's going to be other parts of, of the state we're going to keep working on. Um, but we're really grateful that we'll be working here. Uh, our, our timeline, the governor's given us till 2026. That's the timeline for this project. We will be starting this project next year. Um, we're going to try to pull it in as tight as we can. We don't want to wait until 2026 to have it completed. So we've, we've set some internal goals to get it done faster than that. Um, we're, gonna, we're, we're working towards uh, late 2024 to finish it, but that's a very aggressive goal with a lot of challenges. But that's what our passion is. We want to get that, all that to say we want to get it done. Uh, we didn't win this so we could sit on it. We want it so we can get it done. Um, there were a couple of special helpers, too. Um, we had Paige Duke, the county manager, and Rachel Brown and their team. They did a terrific job in working with Dina and our team on making this happen. So I just wanted to do a shout out for them, too. I guess at this point, I'll, I'll answer questions if you have any. Sir? I got a couple of questions for you. So. So this is this is a pretty aggressive goal, and I applaud your efforts. It's about time we did something like this. How are, how are you going to decide which communities get it first? How do you determine the priority? Is it population based, bigger subdivisions? 
Or, or how did you determine that? Well, as we come into the community, we're going to have to look. See, we've got a lot of network that, that is already existing. So the blue area here, that's areas that are our communities that we've already upgraded. So in the middle of those communities, we had infrastructure. We had fiber going in. And fiber is like a railroad track. You can't start from the middle of nowhere and, and work out. You've got to start from a center point and work out. So we'll be starting from those center points where we have fiber. We also have it edging up on other areas. So. Our engineering department just handles the best way they feel to build that. Once they do the full overview of the project and determine where we need to come in from, um, I I know you know the whole county is the project. Everything in green is the project, and I can't really say where they're going to pick to start from at this point. Uh, I would be guessing if I said, um, but it'll be. You know, because you may have to go through a less dense area to get to a more dense area, just depending on how you come into the county. So it, it's just going to be a matter of the pathways that they decide to come in on. So that that hasn't really been determined yet. Is that, that's what you're saying? I think um, we're we're working on the engineering. So the county is they'll design the county as a whole, and we're working on the environmental of the county as a whole. But as far as exactly where the starting point is, nobody's pointed that out to me yeah. yet. Okay. But it's in the engineering. Okay. So the engineering will yeah. to complete it by the first of the year. Yeah. So when, when, when you make PR announcements, that kind of stuff to the public, and your start date, that's the first question that people are going to ask. When's it coming to my neighborhood? You're ready. Well, I, I think part of it, in my mind, Michael, yeah. is, is again, we'll have some responsibility as well to try to educate the public from the standpoint that, that we've been waiting on this for a long time. The citizens have been waiting on it for a long time. The target goal is 2026, so be patient, it will be there. And I think that's going to be the key, rather than, we know that there's going to be a lot of questions, just like you say, and folks are going to want it, and they want it now. Yeah. But realistically is, they've got to go at it in the very best and most efficient way that they possibly can, and what their engineers, as Mr. Porter had said, how they lay it out, but reality is, is the goal is 2026, we're going to have 18,000 homes here in this community that are now unserved or underserved that we'll be able to have uh, connected. Yeah. And it'll be lit up along the way. So yeah. it's not like you finish and then you light, right. it, you light it up as you go. So yeah. it'll be a progressive progressive path. It's going to be all fiber, too. So um, there shouldn't be any copper in this network. It'll be fiber clear inside the home. So we'll bring, it'll be um, at minimum gig capable, but most of what we're rolling out now is, is multi-gig capable. So I think that everything we would put into this build would be multi-gig capable. So it, it's future-proofing. And that's one thing the state, I'll tell you what, there's been a lot of projects before, but the acceleration of the demand for broadband is, is greater than most other demands that you can calculate. You know, I equate to the interstate system in Atlanta. If it wasn't for money, you know, we wouldn't have traffic jams. You know, and it's the same thing with broadband. The demand has grown faster than, than you can keep up with. You know, Dina and I were talking eight years ago, nine years ago, you know, we were at less than three meg is a standard, and now we're at 25, three is a standard. And when, you know, the incumbent providers said, yeah, we can do internet, we could, we could. you know, it was a dial up mode. It was, and then it was, yeah, we can do three meg or one and a half, but now, now we're past the capacity that those copper lines were intended to handle. They weren't they weren't laid in the ground the same way. I mean, they were laid that that tip and ring on the phone line can travel a long distance because it's really just a little pulse that goes over that copper line, so it can travel a long distance. Broadband doesn't travel that distance. It it degrades quickly when it goes over the copper line. So that's why when you're closer to the electronics with the copper, you can get higher speeds than if you're farther. That's not the case with fiber. So really, with the investment that the state's making, that we're making now, this is future proofing. Because all you're going to have to do over the next 50 years is you're going to change the electronics on the end of it to, to add more speed. And, and that'll be, you won't have to dig up all the lines. Over the next four, six, eight years, you're going to see another just massive infrastructure build like we haven't seen for the last 50 years when they put the power lines and the
tell who lines in originally. Now we're, we're overbuilding all that. So your lines will be in ground? Both. It'll be the most efficient way. We'll go, we'll go underground or overhead, just, with, just depending on the most efficient way. Over the creek. Could be. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can, can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. Yes, sir. Um, so, I can't remember who said this. One of y'all said that uh, $40 million is going to be spent on this project. What's the breakdown? How much of that is coming from the government and how much of that is coming from Windstream? Or are you doing the labor and the government's providing the capital? Or how does that break out? No, Windstream committed $18 million. Okay. Yeah, and then, and then the state, through the federal funds that came, so federal funds to state funds, state allocated the funds, the governor, thank the governor, thank the broadband committee. Um, who decided they were going to make this happen and use these funds this way? Um, they uh, then we were awarded 22 million through the state program. Gotcha. So that's pretty impressive. About a 40 million dollar project, you're picked up roughly half the bill. Yes, sir. That's pretty impressive. So with with so much government money, public money being put into this project, do you anticipate any type of discounted pricing to the residents that that basically is funding half the project? So the, the pricing will be our consistent with our with our market pricing. Okay. The, we do work with the government on their pricing, uh, their their supportive programs that they have. So the government does have a program called um, the Affordable Connectivity Program, and what that does is for those that are eligible um, can apply for that, and it um, offers a thirty dollar credit towards your subscriber fee. And you apply, you can go online and apply for that. As a matter of fact, we promote that through the schools because any student who is eligible for a free reduced lunch, their family is automatically eligible for those programs. So we really do try to focus on um, promoting it through the school systems for sure, but it's also available to anyone. There's, a, there's several different types of eligibility requirements that you have to meet. But, sure. um, but there is that program that we do participate in. Sure. And, and we also, from the county standpoint, we'll be putting that information out there for the citizens on our website, so that it will be that they'll have that information, so that those that really need some help on that cost of connectivity, they'll have a resource that they can utilize. Yeah. And one thing I want to mention about the, the map is the green area is a depiction of the service area. The sunny area is the resource to the state when it had the funds that were available to it that created the state broadband availability map. And what that does is it identifies locations and addresses that um, do not have access to a 25-3 and so those are the locations that are considered eligible for, for the build out. And that's where the 18,000 location numbers were identified was through the state mapping. Gotcha. Um, so the state did a very extensive project working with the University of Georgia um, to um, to develop and create that map. And really, no other state has had a map like it. And so that enables the state to identify exactly where the funding can go and, and what locations are eligible. That's why we brought our retail team and they are set up in the store so that you can check your address to see if it is an eligible address that will be eligible for this build out funding. Gotcha. We'll also leave some information in the county, so we have a QR code that can be scanned and people can pre-register, start pre-registering now for the bill, um, so we can make it as easy as possible for people to sign up. But it's fair to say at this point we're still in the design and the engineering phase. Right? Really early. Yes, and then who ultimately decides how that progress happens? I, mean, I know we've got a lot of state information, I mean, but this county government have any, I guess, any influence on... Well, I, I, I will answer one part of it, and that's the county side of it. Um, the, from the county standpoint, we have expressed our concerns about the fact that we kind of would like to be involved as far as we were talking about the areas that we need to get to, understanding that engineering has its process and you have to have a point to start and all that. But we also know that there's certain areas in the community that certainly has a large need 
And so that's really where we're going to be at. We're really just partnering here with Windstream. They are the professionals. It's going to be their decision as far as when, you know, how those build outs happen. And, and as he said, you know, the engineers are going to say, well, you start at A to be able to get to Z. And so those decisions will be theirs. Uh, but we're going to be working very, very closely. David uh, certainly locally here has assured us of that. He said that, uh, told me earlier before we started the meeting that he and Paige were going to become best of friends simply because of that communication. Um, and, and that's going to be extremely important. But, but I know you're going to be getting questions as a commissioner from your constituents about what's going on, when is it coming, what this, that, and the other. So again, that communication is going to be really key from the county standpoint that we're able to be able to get that information as commissioner so that we can communicate with our, with our constituents. Well, I, mean, I just want to make sure there's not an information breakdown. I mean, we've talked for eight years now about the, the, the guys that are coming, the guys that hang out that are coming in through the Air Force Base and the need for, you know, that community. And it's hard to prioritize. I mean, my district's pretty good compared to the South and the South. But I also know that we've said it's a priority for the Air Force Base to make sure they have the best of the Well, and there, that, that's where our input and communication with David will be at, and then hopefully that works on their plan as far as engineering, that the infrastructure is there for us to be able to serve some of those needs as soon as possible. Yeah. What, what so we the, would like to do, sorry, but what we would like to do is, is continue at different periods of time um, uh, to share the, and, and provide updates, because part of what we're doing today, and if you, if you are an eligible address, you can pre-register. So we would like to pre-register as many of those 18,000 locations as possible so that as we do turn up the service, we can notify that person that that service is available. And so it will be up to, it will be up to you at that time to take the service. Um, so we would like to hold this periodically so we can continue to update what, where the progress is happening and, and, and also do those pre-registrations. And one of the things, um, the state has really put together a really good program in the way that they require, require reporting to happen. Um, quarterly, at, at a minimum, um, reports have to be filed with the state. This is a reimbursement program. So what that means is, is that Windstream will basically cash flow the full $40 million, and then we get reimbursed for the portion from the state. And so that and documentation has to go in to the county and to the state demonstrating that those expenses have been spent for those specific areas before the reimbursement can happen down to the, the ISP partner. On the, on the application process, will you have a presence online where you can go to Windstream and someone can actually put their address in and make that application? Or is there going to be a process such as that? or are your applications going to come from meetings such as this? So they'll come from this, but we can also provide the county with a call. The, okay. There's a, uh, a number that you can call, uh, but we can provide that to you as well. Right, that would be very nice to have. Yeah. yeah, and the QR code mm -hmm. that can be scanned, but you can go ahead and register. Gotcha, okay. Yes, sir. Right. 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 One for Mr. Forrest and one for Mr. Forrest. May I hold one second to finish answering this too? Because, and then I'd love to we'll get it. We are here, this isn't, we, we received funding for everything that was unserved. That's what this was. There are areas that you see that may say, you know, but this one needs it too. And communications are open. This is something that we're, we're building and we say, let's talk about, we really have a pocket that we feel is important. I mean, this, yeah. this is a two-way communication here. Okay, so just wanted to read it. Okay. Yes, sir. We don't have internal TV packages, but we have partnered with DirecTV for DirecTV Stream and YouTube TV. So really, I think the freedom of good broadband just opens you up to what do you want to use. There's so many options out there now for television that you can pay a la carte. If you want to pay $39 a month, if you want to pay $10 a month, if you want to pay $170 a month, choose what you want. You've now got the freedom. If 
we've got a good internet connection to the home. That's our goal here, is to provide you a really good internet connection, but we do have those two partnerships that we want. Mark, is this an, ex an exclusive, is there an exclusivity contract here? Back in the days of well, when cable TV, when cable was widespread in the county, at one point actually enforced a, uh, a franchise for a single company. No, uh, this, this is not an exclusivity contract. Again, keeping in mind that, as Mr. Forrest has said, basically the contract is, is the agreement that was made with the state in order to get the funding that they were going to serve these unserved areas. And so that really is what we're focusing on here. Uh, these folks <coughs> presently have little to none, and so the, the goal is, is to serve those, but there will not be any exclusivity contracts that will be between Wayne Stream and Lambert. So another company, if they decide to come in and serve this area or that area, yeah, be free that's, that's still the free market and they'll be able to do that. Um, but this, this is for getting that infrastructure in place in these areas where it's unserved or unserved. Isn't that a little bit like water, though, once you have what you own the lines? <clears throat> But uh, typically in this kind of a distribution, they're not going to use cars to get there. If somebody, they may use a, um, a transport line to get into the area, um, but typically another provider is just going to look for when it gets enough density, then they're going to come. Right now, the challenge is, is we're working on rural Georgia. It's just not dense enough for most of the companies to say, ah, yeah, that's a great return on investment. Let me go there. But over time, as areas of your counties grow and become more dense, other providers will look at it and they'll say, we want to go there too now, now that it's more dense and we can get right. yeah. It's the same thing that we're already seeing in some of our older subdivisions where you already have multiple services in there. Again, it's a provider making that financial decision to say, I think we can go in there and get some business and we can make it work, and they put that infrastructure in there. They may run that infrastructure there and never get a single connection. That's just a decision they have to make. Daryl, you look like you wanted to say something. I, I was just going to address the engineering. The, the engineering for Lambs County was outsourced, and it, it's kind of in phases. It, it's been engineered, but those drawings, they go back to our internal group to look over it and scan over it and, and they mark it up and send it back out for uh, a relook or, or a change in what they have drawn. But the, the initial phase has been done. Yeah, we're moving along with the engineer. One more question back. I apologize for coming in just a minute, but uh, the, the the infrastructure for us, the, the uh, looking out 40 years, 20 years from now, with the, the, the uh, fire rocket that we're using, uh, they're looking out to, to that degree because as time grows, we know the, the bigger the service, the, 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 the bigger the program, the more it draws and stuff. And uh, within, you know, the time they make this circle around, circulating all of us. Then we went back to the slow dial of mobile again. Yeah. You know, the, the, the fiber that is feeding certain areas of Georgia is over 20 years old now. We've had it for, for a long time. Right. And years ago, all they needed was a gig over that to feed the full backbone. Right. And then it went to 10 gig, and now we're at 100 gig. Right. You know, uh, so that same fiber is doing that. And that's going to be the same scenario with the fiber that we're putting in here. We're testing 400 and 800 gig waves right now on fiber. So um, capacity is not the issue with fiber. All they do is they change, they change the electronics on it, the light waves, you know, that they're creating more colored structures so they can run more layers on each fiber. It's just amazing what they're doing with the fiber um, to, to increase the demand the ability to meet demand over time. So the, the glass is gonna, 
it's it's the right thing for the future. <clears throat> yes, sir. I, I just wanted to say something about the you know, uh, personally, this is truly a blessing for Lowndes County. Uh, I recall the days of us when I first uh, was elected on the commission talking about trying to fund it ourselves as a county government through a splash referendum and how much it's going to cost. And long story short, to get where we are now, it's not costing us anything. We got the forty million dollars that we're throwing at this. We're talking about nine hundred miles of fiber. And it's just truly investment. So yeah. I'm just happy to be a part of it. Well, forty million was the price tag we had back then, yeah, that one. Um, and we were nowhere near nine hundred miles. Mm -hmm. Nowhere, nowhere near. So absolutely, you know, it, this is. But but we've said and we've had these discussions a long time. You know, the, the need was there. Everybody recognized the fact that the need was there. But the funding mechanism has always been the biggest issue. And it was something that was much bigger than what local government could do. And so it was going to take the federal input, it was going to take state input to be able to make it happen. And unfortunately, COVID is what really brought that to the forefront, the fact that we had so many folks that were working from home that needed that connectivity. We had children that couldn't get the education that they were needing because their uh, parents were having to make those tough choices of send my child to school or keep them at home. And they didn't have the ability to do that, and so they were having to go down the road to a friend's or go to a park somewhere where they had connectivity to do their homework, which was really a sad situation that we had here. So what we've done through this and through the help of this program, we, we've been able to, we're going to be able to address these needs. Again, focus on those folks that are unserved and underserved here in the community. Uh, get those taken care of. So again, that's, it's huge for Lowndes County. Jim, we, 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 we feel we're a blessing to be. You can ask anyone on the team. We, we truly do love rural Georgia. So to be a part of making a difference in rural Georgia that, that you enjoy going to work every day. You know, Yes, we're the incumbent telephone company in other parts of the state too. You know, So there are areas where we are still working on getting every place that we have copper. And those are the hard ones. You know, hey, can't you do something? Well, we're, we're working on getting there. but. You know, this this will make, um, we're probably close, I know two years ago when I did the math, we were at 500 million, so this, we've got to be getting close to three quarters of a billion dollars that we've invested in Georgia, that the wind streams invested in Georgia, to get these areas, you know, that you see now. And we've got over 525,000 households we passed that had 20 meg, 25 meg or more. And just since 2019, we've built out over 200,000 households that have access to gig. So we've been, we've been making a dent in it, but this program, is, it's a tremendous help to us to allow us to go faster than we've been able to do out of our own pockets. It makes a, it makes a big difference. Yes, I'm sorry, one final question. I forgot to ask you while there. The 18,000 uh, residents that you're planning on serving, are you planning on taking fiber to all 18,000, or will it be a combination of fiber and copper? It'll be heavy be fiber, no all copper, right. all the way into the house. Right. Yeah, it actually will we'll put a small pushable fiber that we put into the house and then we connect the fiber right inside the house. So, you know, yeah, there's nothing, no, no metal there, no copper. And that's a real plus too because the, the fiber doesn't have the electrostatic, you know, yeah. nature that copper does. So you don't have to deal with all of the side effects and the temperature extremes don't affect it the way it's just a great medium. Do you have anything you would like to say, sir? Uh, I'd just like to say I'm proud to be a part of this, and I'm excited about it. Um, you know, in my, in my office in the Capitol, I've got an 8 by 10 picture, and it was taken in 1960. And my wife's granddaddy took this picture. And um, it's a uh, state highway, 122. And he was trying to get money from the state to do something about the roads in South Georgia, right? And so there's a lot of truck and a car. And there's a sign there that says Georgia Highway 122. And the log truck and the car can't pass. Mm. And it's a state highway and it's a dirt road. And so I, I tell people in Atlanta that, that the reason I have that picture in my office is because that's an illustration of where so much of rural Georgia is today in terms of rural broadband. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm excited about this. And, I, and there's a lot more to do. Um, but we're making, we're making a stab at it. You know, they say you eat the one bite at a time. But we're, here lately we've been taking some pretty good bites and so you know and it's an issue not just about quality of life and it's not just about you know, my kids you know when, when COVID had school shut down they 
online learning was not something that they were, they were able to do, but it also addresses in today's modern times with food security. I mean, you know, I know in terms of being able to operate uh, a lot of this sophisticated machinery we've got to have on our farms and stuff for it. Um, it's just got huge implications. And so um, I want to also, uh, John LaLue can't be here. Um, John is actually, y'all don't, don't tell on him, but he's deer hunting in Illinois right now. Um, but uh, I, I want to give a shout out to John. You know, John served on this committee. I was on the board and steward committee. Um, John was on this real broadband committee. And, um, you know, I really appreciate that his district sits inside my district because uh, his, uh, his district got a, a very, uh, he was very well represented in terms of allocation of resources. And so, uh, he, he did a good job and, and did a good job serving this community and South Florida on that. So I just well, I'm going to tell on Russ just a little bit again but how much we appreciate what he does and what that job demands. Uh, the session is 40 days. Um, I called Russ one time, figured he was probably leaving on Friday afternoon, headed back to the farm to check on his blueberries. And he said, no, I've got a stack of applications here I've got to go through. And it was all about, on his committee was the water and sewer side, but you can imagine the same thing that John LaHood was having to do. So these folks were having to take their time when they could be at their families to work through all of these applications, <coughs> where these needs were at. So again, when we think about a 40-day session, it's much bigger than 40 days. So. Russ, again, as I said earlier, we certainly appreciate your efforts. I know when you were doing water and sewer, but realizing that our delegation was working as a team and it helped this come together with John LeVoo and John Corbett, Dexter Sharper, so again, and, and Mr. Burchett. So again, very, very important in our great representation that we have, so we thank you very much for that. Are there any other questions at this time? David, you have yeah, one, one thing. Ms. Penny House, Russ, Ms. Watson, John, if you find before we have 18 that were approved, how many were approved statewide that we have not had 18 counties? Six or seven are right here. Mm -hmm. That's Thomas County, Bruce County, Copper County, Lowndes County, Cook County, Marion County, and that's the four of our state. Mm -hmm. And the commissioners in these counties following their lead that this, this is good for Georgia, South Georgia. Yeah, I'll tell you that that travel has become quite normal from Cleveland, Georgia to, <laughs> to South Georgia over the last, we got that down and, you know, like I said, though, I love it. It's just, just a beautiful place to be served. Well, I, I just want to say I'm very excited because as, uh, once I retired out of the military uh, at 31 years, I came back home and, and with Mr. DeMarcus came out in the rural area that we live in. I was petitioning for faster internet. I went down the streets, hey, everybody, sign up, you know, call in. Call, keep calling and bugging people. They always see the application saying, we getting, you get this internet speed? I say, call, put them on the spot, make come out and do a survey. And I am ecstatic, I am part of corporate America that are still using the internet because during this COVID time frame, it, everything you can look around, <coughs> Everything uh, the internet maintains. I mean, from everybody, from the kids, uh, teleworking, which I telework, I work out in Huntsville, Alabama, still been teleworking right here. And using the wind stream, although I wouldn't get the best speed, but I'll get some speed, which I'm blessed and, and thankful. But I just want to say, you know, I'm excited and looking forward. Now, when it get here, it get here. But we know they long long time on the road, we good. So I want to say thanks. Thank you. Okay. Fine. Fine. I got a final question. Where do we sign up? Did you have one more? I don't have a question, but I wanted to say something to the commission, to the chairman. Uh, I'm not easily impressed by government at any level, especially nowadays, but this is impressive. Y'all are doing a good thing. Good. I commend you. They are. Right. They have been terrific to work with. I mean, they, there's some communities that you really enjoy working with. Dina, you can speak to it. Um, you've been, you got a great, great leadership. Good. Well, we want that to continue because it's extremely important to how fluid this process moves forward. So we'll continue to see Lowndes County. We're going to work with you in every aspect that we can. So. I think, you know, we, we communicate with, uh, with the commissioners and the 
with our county contact we communicate with Lambs County probably on a weekly basis. So we're very engaged um, through the process and we'll continue to accept. So if there's anyone here that wants to look at their address and, and what the availability is and or sign up, we've set up an area right next door in our multi purpose room. You just go out this door and hang a right and uh, folks are over there and we can kind of get through with that process in the beginning. Thank y'all for coming. I appreciate it very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you.